Yeah, welcome everybody to my session about the making of uh, V, the stereography about V. Um, v is a Russian adventure kind of horror movie, uh, which is based on an old story from Gogol, a very famous um, writer in in the last um, uh, in the in the nineteenth uh, in the eighteenth century. Uh, no, um, 19th century, sorry. And um, the movie that we are seeing here and uh, that I want to present today is um, actually uh, was pretty successful in Russia so far. So they sold uh, or they made more than 40 million US dollar in just uh, three and a half weeks. And this only in uh, Russia and Ukraine. And the international version is not out yet. It will be out in the summer. So I'm guessing either in um, uh, May or in June. And uh, I'd like to show you a little bit about, um, about the movie, what we did. I have a making of. I have a 30 minute DCP that, that I won't show in total, but uh, I will show a little bit of it. And uh, then we can have as well uh, some questions afterwards. So uh, just about the company, so we are a rig manufacturer um, for automatic uh, rig systems and we're as well a service provider. Maybe some of you know Hans and Gretel Witch Hunters, um, maybe some of you knew, uh, know Wiki and the Treasure of the Gods. Um, these were movies that were pretty successful on, on, the, on the box office. And um, I'm telling you now about uh, V. So this project actually was a, it had a very long history and a difficult history. Because the movie was um, started or was uh, planned to start in 2007. And um, this is most probably the, the biggest independent movie um, that has been there worldwide. Because they, they collected more than 70 million for this um, adventure movie. Um, this is including, of course, the marketing costs, but so the movie itself was a little bit uh, cheaper. And um, uh, due to the reason that it's an independent movie and they, they had a distributor in the beginning, um, they had to have several stops. So they started in 2007 filming this movie actually on film in 2D, so on 35 millimeter film. And um, so they they were then deciding, okay, let's do this movie in 3D. So we had to convert the first 20 minutes, more or less. But uh, the whole movie is like two hours and 20 minutes. So this is the Russian version. The international version will be a little bit um, uh, shorter. It will be about 90 minutes. And uh, we actually came on board uh, on in 2011. So uh, four years after the movie started. Uh, to shoot the the rest of the the movie, so the the two hours that were left, and um, so the challenge was that we had actually three different formats in this movie that the post production had to deal with because we had original film stock, 35 millimeter film. Um, then in between, before we came on board, they shot like I think three days with a different stratigraphier uh, on. Uh, and with a different rig on uh, red epics, but uh, no red um, uh, red ones. But at this time, uh, the they didn't sync up the camera, so all this footage that they recorded in these three days, they had to uh, convert them because it was completely out of sync. So this was the second part of the material, and then uh, Sirte came on board, and um, and we shot actually with um, with Ari uh, Ari Alexas and. Um, and uh, most of the shooting was done in uh, Czech Republic. So what is the technical condition now to shoot um, a live action 3D feature and to make it in an economic way? So uh, economic means that you don't take too much time. Um, you basically shoot on a 2D schedule. Um, um, your whole material is, is very well prepared for post, so you don't need to fix things in post or realign things in post. And I think one of the, the most important things, of course, for the filming on set, because this is like the most expensive time uh, on a project, uh, uh, is where 
where you just need to be as fast as 2D because otherwise you have the problem that you would take additional days and one day in, in filming native is, or in filming in general is pretty expensive. So you try to have it in the same time like a, a 2D feature. Uh, the other secret for being fast is um, uh, all of our rigs is, are motorized, so that means if we do a lens change or something, uh, if we work for example with zooms, we can do it right away. Um, there's as well uh, automatic alignment software uh, from Stereolabs, for example, the Pure. And, um, so in this kind of way you can shoot extremely fast and uh, this is for me some of the um, or should I say, some of the basics that need to be there in order to make uh, really a 2D uh, schedule. Uh, then of course uh, we need to record as well all the metadata for the post because this was as well a movie that was uh, pretty CG heavy. We have uh, quite some uh, monsters in it um, and uh, the post needed to have all this metadata in order to create um, uh, these shots. And um, what I want to talk uh, today is I like to talk a little bit about the different artistic cooperation on a film set. So how does the team work together um, on this uh, 3D film set? Then about different technical choices that you do on the film set. For example, a different um, choice of lens, um, a different staging. Uh, we used a lot of times plan sequences. Um, which are much more natural than if you would cut in an MTV style. Um, we would take transitions from one shot to the other. Um, we would make sure that we always have something in the background as well, some texture, because without texture you're not seeing very far plane is. So that means if you just have a hat in front of black, you cannot judge how far is the background away from the main character, uh, because you don't have any reference. So that means um, if you shoot that, you always try to, to light up the background in a way that there's still texture uh, in order to see where it's located. And then, of course, uh, when we use uh, out-screen effects, we try to use it in a, in a way that it's related to the story, because everything else would be gimmicky. So that means you try to use it in a creative, artistic way, and uh, then it's not gimmicky at all. It just underlines the story, and it helps you to come closer into the story. So um, one big difference, of course, in a 3D feature is that um, as a, uh, there's um, a new team on board, of course, so the stereography uh, uh, team, and you have a stereographer or even more, so depending on how many units you have, and um, the stereographer completes the creative team, so that means you're working together with the DP and the director, and it should be absolutely on eye level, so it doesn't help if the stereographer is considered somewhere else and, um, and the stereographer has no, no possibility to talk with the DP about, for example, the, the choice of lens. Because in 3D you shoot always a little bit wider than you would to in, in 2D. So everything else, uh, which goes more than 40 millimeter, for example, gets extremely flat. So you have this cardboard effect, so everything looks like a cutout uh, cardboard. And this is not very nice for 3D and it takes you actually out of the story. And uh, what we want to do is we want to preserve the, the natural feeling so that you have really the, the impression that you're in the story, you're there, and um, we, we try to avoid everything that would take you out of the story because it's not normal or it's not how we experience it in our daily lives. So again, it's, it's, for me it's very important that, that it's actually a team where um, the director can talk to the DP and the stereographer about how we do something, how we make the staging of a scene, um, how do we use the 3D creatively in order to enhance the story. Um, the other thing is that um, what I already talked about is that in 3D we would avoid extreme close-ups. So that means close-ups where you have a framing like that for example. Um, that would be too tight for 3D, everything would would just get too gigantic on the screen. And um, as I said, we want to keep the, the viewer in, in this uh, feeling that the viewer is involved, is there, and it's kind of natural because we want to avoid everything which is not natural because that takes you out of the story. So the same of the lens, we are always a little bit wider 
So on this feature, for example, we used mainly like a 21 or 25 millimeter lens and um, our range was between 18 and 40 and, um, um, and it worked pretty well, I have to say. And as well, um, one thing we have to consider as well, if you cut, for example, from an extreme wide angle to an extreme tailor lens, um, it would not look good from the depth continu continuity as well, because on a wide shot, um, especially if you have a little bit of bigger IA, everything looks or tends to look uh, more um, miniature, or you, of course you avoid this, but this is the, the tendency, you know, and if you cut then to extreme close-up where everything looks gigantic, um, then you wouldn't have a depth continuity in, in your shot. So you would avoid this, you, so you, you, would, you, you would avoid all these extremes, basically. Then one of the most important things are uh, so-called plan sequences. So that means um, when you have, for example, when you move your camera, you get a lot of monocular and, of course, binocular depth cues. So that means if you slightly move your camera all the time, you get an enhanced feeling of depth. And um, by having a plan sequence, what you do is you combine different shots to one single shot. So instead of having like a close-up and then I cut to a wide and then I cut to a over the shoulder and then I cut to a two shot whatever you would always try if it's appropriate of course and if it supports the story you'd w you would always try to take it together to one single camera move so that means you're starting on a close-up then you go to the over the shoulder then you end up in a wide shot or whatever so you you link together all these um, shots in one single camera movement. And that has two big advantages. The one advantage is that actually the, the feeling is much more natural. It's like we, we are walking around here, so I, I pick up a detail, I go closer, I, I pick it up, um, uh, I go wider, I, I look at somebody, you know, so everything is like linked together and it's not this, um, I think in 3D, uh, MTV style cutting in general for the movie, for certain scenes it's okay, but in general for the movie wouldn't work. And uh, you can see this on like big movies, uh, Hollywood movies sometimes, uh, especially converted ones, where they, where they shot in 2D, they added in 2D, and then they just try to, to make it 3D, but it's actually a 2D movie with depth, but it's not a 3D movie. And uh, for the viewer, in the end, it doesn't make any difference if he watches it in 2D or 3D because it's, it's basically the same, uh, more or less. So, with making a 3D movie, you need to think in 3D. And this is so important. Um, you need to stage differently. And even I would as well say, a good 3D movie looks as well pretty good in 2D. And um, by using these kind of plan sequences, um, you give as well the, you have a second advantage is that you can linger along over shots. So you can look around, you can see the fine little details, uh, which you couldn't do if, if you kept very fast. <clears throat> so most of the time we were using uh, a Techno Crane. This was a Techno 50 here at the set. You see they built uh, the, the lower part of an old church here. And um, uh, most of the times we always had uh, a crane. Um, sometimes we had we had a fixed crane, uh, which was a panther, uh, and most of the time, of course, we, we tried to use the telescopic crane because it's so easy to to make the the different camera movements without changing the base of the crane. So that means from just one location, you can operate so many different shots, and it doesn't take any time. So it's very handy to to have uh, a kind of uh, crane like this. Then the other thing that I said is. We were only using out-screen effects where it was related to the story. There were films out there where they just used the out-screen effect because of the out-screen effect. But it, it didn't make any difference if the yo-yo that went to the camera was there or if it wasn't there. You know, it, it wouldn't change in the story. But um, if you use the out-screen effects, if it's related to the story, then it can enhance the story and only there. And uh, we did this uh, a couple of times uh, in this movie. The uh, next thing um, I like to show you is the uh, making of, and I will uh, talk a little bit to that. 
the uh, stereoscopic post-production uh, was done at Cine Post-Production in Munich, um, a company that, that had gained his experience um, since quite a few projects. And uh, what they did is they did the whole uh, sweetening process uh, for, the, for the material. So sweetening means that you adapt the two images towards each other. Um, so that means there's always a slight color shift if you shoot with a, with a beam splitter. That's nature, that's physics. Um, this is one thing. Then, of course, you always have a little bit distortion from the lens, which is as well nature. So um, there are lenses that are better. There are lenses that are not that good, even out of the same series. Uh, you can have luck sometimes, sometimes not so much. Um, of course, you try to choose your pairs of lenses before shooting, but reality sometimes is, okay, we have just these three pairs, just pick the best, and we, we don't have more. So that's, that's reality. Or sometimes even you're happy if you have everything you want, uh, because a lot of shooting is going on, for example, at the rental house and so on. So we did, by the way, the, the project with our rental together. And um, yeah, again, coming back to the, to the sweeting process, so what they did there was um, they built up a complete post pipeline um, where they had the possibility to, to ingest, of course, all the, the different material. And then they had a, like a semi-automatic um, uh, workflow and pipeline where they made sure that uh, all the material um, is going through uh, um, the Ocular plugin, and um, uh, which actually helps you in this matching process just to get the, the best quality out of the, the material. And then, of course, they recorded in RE RAW, so that means they had all the possibilities um, to work on this material. And um, uh, they build up uh, quite some knowledge um, in doing the, the whole sweetening process. After the sweetening process, the material is like geometrically, color-wise, uh, perfect. Um, I mean, left eye to right eye. And um, what you do then is uh, you have the, the color grading process, which was as well done at Cine Post, and you have the depth grading process. And um, so what they had is they had always kind of promo reels, so we were depth grading uh, quite a while for all the different material. But the good thing was that you could reuse like a, a certain kind of grading um, if you have the same shot again. So everything was, was built up there. And now I'm just um, wanting to, to show you the, what they did. So this, these are like the native shot material without any any realignment without any correction, uh, nothing, not, not even a color correction, anything. And after the, um, the whole pipeline and of course the color grading, which is of course the, the biggest difference between them, um, you just make sure that, that you as well have calculated out anything uh, which comes from lens dis distortion or things like this. So, um, Again, they build up a, a pretty good workflow there, and um, and we had as well the possibility, or they, I have to say thank you to Cinepost as well, because they just extracted these 30 minutes that I'm going to show you, or part of it. Um, they extracted this um, now here for this lecture. Um, the the excerpt that I'm going to uh, show you is is not really cut together, so it's just taking out of the main feature, and there's no audio link or anything, so the audio jumps um, uh, quite a while. This is why why I'm saying um, we're watching this just with the with the audio like uh, just on on half level, and uh, it's not a real show reel. We we want to, we want to make a, a real show reel out of it, but um, we just uh, get access to this material a couple of days ago. So we're happy to have it, and I'm happy to, to be able to show something. But again, it's, it's not a show reel like you would expect it. It's just cut together of some scenes out of the movie. Um, OK, so let's play it, please. We had, or they had, more than 40 million. Uh, you made more than 40 million US dollars uh, in, just in Russia and Ukraine. And um, the movie will be internationally released in May or June. Uh, but then, of course, in a short version, because uh, part of the reason why it's that long, or it, it had been that long, two hours and 20 minutes, was 
that that it actually reflects the this whole story from Goggle, you know. And um, but for a foreigner, it would be maybe rather boring what happens in this small little town because you know they they have this history uh, with this story together and and we don't know it basically. So they they want to present it more out of the out of the eye of a foreigner, so out of the eye of of Jonathan Green. So they want to they have a re-edit of the movie, and uh, they re-edited it in um, uh, in LA. And um, now the the Cinepros production is working on getting the material together. Uh, sometimes they even change the length of the shots. So some parts they they have to redo some ZG, for example. So um, it's a it's a pretty big effort they they are putting into this movie. But um, but I think the look look is pretty interesting. Yes. Um, um. When it comes down to uh, Russian films, do they, is it a fairly normal thing to have um, such a long film? Uh, that's a good question. Um, of course, they, they sometimes, for example, the original <coughs> movie, uh, we from 67 was, I think, about three hours or even more. So in this regard, this movie is short. <laughs> But uh, <coughs> of course, they are playing as well all kinds of um, Western movies there, so uh, like Avatar, uh, then Stalingrad, which is a pretty Western movie, even if it was shot in, in Russia, you know. And um, yeah, so I cannot give you uh, an, an answer what is the average length there, but in general, yes. The, uh, the movies would be a little bit longer than, than we were expecting it. Yes. Uh, quick one, Florian. In the beginning, the cutting seemed quite fast. Was that just because it was the cut in the trailer, or was that actually from the original footage? Uh, that was all mixed together. So, yeah, okay. But uh, the other thing is concerning cuts. Um, yes, for even for the director, it was sometimes cut too fast, but um, the American investors always told them we need to have it fast, we need to have it, you know, the pace should, should be driven. Um, so personally, I, I like it more if, it's, if the cutting stands a little bit back, so if it's not this MTV style cutting, but we had as well a lot of sequences that, that were really long shots. For example, when he stands in this um, church and praying, the camera goes completely around him and it's a shot of Two minutes or something, so it's really long. Um, so, so the beginning of the beginning of the, the trailer, those, those that cutting was actually from the original film, or just the way it's cut for the trailer. Uh, there was part and part, part so yeah, okay. we mixed together here in this in this week. Again, um, it's just the the rough footage what we will be using to make like a best of V out of it, because it was just um, otherwise I couldn't show anything today, and I wanted to show something, and um, I think it's good to to have at least this year, even if it was not cut perfectly together as a show. Anything else? Yeah, one more question. One more question. Yeah. So they didn't they want to make it initially as an international release or you know, make it in Russia? They, so they, they yeah. put so much work there. They, they planned it, yeah, they, they planned it from the beginning as having two versions. Um, which is quite surprising, but uh, on the other hand, um, I mean, re-editing um, doesn't cost that much concerning that they made with the original version, Russian version, already more than 40 millions, because they wanted to present in Russia a version that is really adapted to the story of Gogol, which wouldn't make sense for the international one because nobody is knowing this, you know? So who, who knows the, the old story about me here? Well, who knows? <laughs> you know, it's a, at, least, at least one. <laughs> so um, again, but in, if, if I would ask the same question in the Russian auditorium, I think like 95% would raise the hand or maybe 100%. So, so in Russia, everybody knows the story. And um, so the thing is really to get this movie out there in Russia in a way that it's appreciated from the Russian, um, from the Russian audience. And apparently it was because it was the most successful movies in history. 
I mean, there was no other Russian movie which was more successful than this one here. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask.